Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, sorry for the slight change in the Zoom room. Um, the professor cannot join us today, and I wasn't able to join the um, the main room for some reason, so I had to throw out the impromptu Zoom link. So if you are here, congratulations. Thank you for checking your email or for checking your announcements diligently. Um, I hope I'm recording. Yeah, I am. Okay, good. Uh, that would be a travesty. But anyways, today we're going to be doing the in-class exercises for curve fitting and root finding. So if you scroll down to Canvas, um, well, actually, before that, uh, just to take a look at the calendar, we don't really have much that's due. Um, let's see. So the only thing that's due is the uh, curve fitting workshop, which is a little bit of curve fitting. And then the last problem, which is very short, is an introduction to what's called interpolation. So quite literally reading between the lines. Um, yes, I know we didn't really cover it, but I do think the problem is sort of simple enough that the documentation should be sufficient. Um, I, I think the entire problem is like two lines of code or something like that. So hopefully it gives you a good sense of sort of what you can do beyond curve fitting and the utility that curve fitting slash interpolation can provide to a data set. Um, so hold on, let me uh, bring these people into the meeting from the waiting room. Okay, and then we have homework five due um, in five days. And then sort of taking a look ahead, we have the root finding workshop. So the stuff on bisection and Newton graphs and all that, that's not due this weekend, but the following weekend. So that's just a look at the calendar. And then as for uh, the in-class exercises, if you scroll all the way down, here's the PDF. Um, yep, it's right up here. And then here's a data set that we're gonna be using in one of the problems. Now, before we do, any of these in-class exercises. Um, I, I got a couple emails from students asking, uh, you know, like we, we learned all of these root finding methods, right? So there's bisection, there's a secant method, there's newton raphson MATLAB has a, a whole slew of root finding methods, built-in functions. And so people are asking like, well, what, what's, what's the difference between one and another? Or how do I know when to use one method versus the other? I think that's a very valid question. So I'm going to, uh, what I did is I just drew up a very simple script here. Um, if you want me to post this, I, I can, but it's, this is kind of for demonstration illustrative purposes only. So basically what we have here is a really simple function. So I'm just going to say, we want to find the root of sine of X. Obviously the derivative is cosine. So if we run it, um, let's see, up until now, all I did was plot it. And yes, I should have labeled the, um, the axes and stuff, but for simplicity, this up here is the sine graph and this up here, or this down here is the cosine graph. Hopefully that's pretty apparent. And let's say we wanna find the root that occurs around six. So this is two pi. We have multiple ways of doing this. We can use the bisection method or we can use a newton raphson it doesn't matter which one we use, but hopefully we should get the same result. Now, one sort of subtlety with both of these root finding methods is that they can only be used to locate one root at a time. So if we try to apply the bisection method across this entire domain from zero to 12, while well, looking at the graph, we should have three roots, I guess technically five if you count the endpoints, but I'm going to discount those for now. And you know, that's very obvious from the graph. But if you call the bisection function that was given to you in class, so if, uh, if you download um, this bisect function and this Newton simple function, and then you try to call either of those functions with the appropriate initial guesses, you're only going to get one output. And that's because bisection Newton simple or slash Newton Raphson can only be used for one root at a time. So if a homework problem or something asks you to find all three of these roots, you need to call the function three times, one for each root, and then change your initial guesses appropriately. So when we're talking about bisection, one of the biggest advantages of bisection is that it will always converge to the correct answer, provided you give it valid initial guesses. And so this can be pretty advantageous whenever you have a pretty wavy function or a function with multiple roots like this, uh, because you, all you have to do is just look at the plot and then pick your initial guesses accordingly, and then you're all set. You don't need to worry about what the derivative of the function is. 
So if we had some really nasty looking function that you just know would be a beast to differentiate, either symbolically in MATLAB or by hand, normally I just revert to bisection because I don't feel like calculating the derivative. But in this case, because the function is pretty easy, I don't mind calculating the derivative. So I would be okay with using newton raphson too. Uh, the, I guess the advantage of newton raphson is that unlike bisection, you only need to provide one initial guess. But the downside is you need to have knowledge of not only the function, but how the derivative of the function behaves as well. Because the derivative of the function will dictate what the next estimate, the, what the next root estimate is. And depending on your initial guess and the behavior of the derivative at that point, and I guess across the entire continuum, then that may lead to some pretty screwy answers too. So there's a lot more variability involved in newton raphson at the cost of easier user operation because you only have to supply one initial guess instead of two. So when you have multiple roots like this, um, or I guess like anyways, just sort of going back to the very beginning, I've, I always have a very strong emphasis on plots and that is especially true in this unit when we're talking about curve fitting and root finding. So whenever you are given some data set, such as the one here, the first thing you should always do is just instinctively plot it. Or whenever you're given some type of function, um, for example, if we go to the in-class exercises, you see this equation. First thing you should do is plot it. Don't even look at the rest of the problem. Just, just instinctively plot this. Make it second nature. And that's especially true because when you're dealing with things that rely on the quality of your initial guesses, such as bisection and newton raphson um, there was a point in class the other day where something like, well, we need to choose our upper and lower guesses accordingly. And the question is, well, how do we do that? And my, my simple solution is just plot it. Like you don't even need to know what the, what the Y values at those X points precisely are. You just need to know that for bisection, one of them has to be above zero and the other one has to be below zero. It doesn't matter if, you know, the numerical value turns out to be like 0.5 or negative 0.5, you just need to know that one is positive, one is negative. Using a plot, you know, it, it's, it's super simple. It's not that complex in MATLAB. And then it allows you to quickly uh, pick a, a very suitable initial guess or guesses. So that's the power of plotting here. And also in curve fitting, when you're looking at a data set such as this one, you should always plot it just to make, <clears throat> excuse me, just to make sure that you are in fact plotting something or you are fitting a linear model. And if it's not linear, well, you should think about how you're gonna transform it too. So that's just the very quick power of plotting, um, especially in this unit. Okay, so bisection. Let's say we wanna find the root at around x equals six. Um, this is actually two pi. So. For bisection, we need to supply an upper guess and a lower guess. What we could do is we could set the, uh, the lower guess to one. And so that means our upper guess has to be something negative. Let's say we choose 10. These are two very valid initial guesses. When we run the code, uh, let's see. I'm just going to add a breakpoint right here. When we run the code, we see that it took 42 iterations and the root we converged on is not two pi, but is pi. So yes, MATLAB gave you a correct answer because there is in fact a root crossing at pi, but it's not the answer we were looking for because we wanted to find the one at two pi. So even though you may have two technically mathematically valid initial guesses, these, you know, it's not going to give you, not necessarily going to give you the right answer. So from the plot, why don't we readjust this? We can say, why don't we make our lower guess six and then, um, okay, so six, so the Y value at six is below zero. So we need to pick an upper guess that's above zero. Let's just say, I don't know, 6.5. Now let's see what we get. Okay, so now we converged as we sort of expected on the right answer because we provided a very narrow initial bracket for MATLAB. 
So, natu <clears throat> so naturally, we were sort of guaranteed to converge to six. So just using the plot, we can very quickly identify two very suitable points. And also the advantage is the smaller you make your initial bracket, the less work MATLAB has to do. We can see that instead of 42 iterations, we change, uh, we decrease it to 38. So it's less computational effort on MATLAB's part. Obviously, you don't have to be zooming in, you know, super close to try to get a very refined guess unless your function is very oddly behaved that at that point. Okay, so let's move on to um, Newton Raphson and see what we get here. So I'm gonna just comment this stuff out because it's irrelevant. If we chose an initial guess of three, so once again, with Newton Raphson, you only need to supply one initial guess instead of two. So now we don't have the limitation on, okay, well, does one need to be positive and the other needs to be negative? Well, it doesn't matter since we only have one initial guess. So we chose our initial guess equals three. And expectedly, um, we converge on the root at pi. If we were, you know, if we wanted to find the root at two pi, obviously three would be a really bad initial guess, but you might not know that unless you plotted this. Now, I mean, I, I, you can make the argument that for a simple function like sine of x, if you plug in three, you know that there's going to be a root at pi, so you can sort of intuit that it was going to converge to this answer. But for a sake of illustration, if you had a very oddly structured function that you just can't visualize, um, if you just sort of blindly typed in an initial guess, then you may converge on a mathematically correct answer but perhaps the wrong answer that you're looking for. So what if we tried, instead of three, what if we tried five? Because five appears closer to, you know, our root around two pi. Okay, so it's gonna be about here. Well, now the issue is we converge at the root over here. And that, that sort of makes sense because if you, you know, look at this point and you just kind of visualize the tangent line, um, it's trending in the direction of about here. And when you get to about this point, um, in the next iteration, the slope at this point, um, or the tangent line is gonna be pointed down about here. So it wouldn't make sense that we're converging on this route here and we're just completely bypassing um, the route at two pi, which is what we want. So even though five is pretty close to six, it's not close enough because this function is sort of oddly behaved something as simple as the sine function. So if we then try six, which is very close, now we converge on the right answer. So the, the basic premise of this very simple example is first off, always plot, always, always, always. Um, number two, that plot can help, can help inform um, some of your initial guess if you're using newton raphson or both of your guesses if you're using bisection. Number three, even though you may be technically supplying mathematically correct upper and lower guesses for bisection, if the function has multiple roots, you may end up converging to the wrong one, which is another reason why you should plot it, because sometimes you don't even know the function has multiple roots in the first place. And then number four, even if an initial guess or guesses look very close to what is the supposed root, so for example, if we chose initial guess as five, you may converge to the other root too, just because of the way not only the function is behaved, but the way that the derivative of the function works. So just some, just a lot of things to keep in mind. Um, this really shows the power of plotting. Now, when it comes to the question, okay, um, do I use bisection or newton raphson I really hate to say it depends, but it depends. First off, it depends a lot on your personal preference. So, um, I personally like bisection more than Newton Raphson just because all I know, you know, all I need to do is pick two upper and lower guesses that are relatively close to my desired root, and I'll let MATLAB do the rest. I don't need to compute what the derivative is, which is really nice because a lot of the time we use root finding in the first place is because the function is nasty or because you sort of can't, you know, analytically solve for x. And so when you have these really long equations, um, you know, you, you already have a chance of maybe mistyping the function itself if it's pretty complicated. So then when you go to differentiate it, either symbolically or by hand, um, you can run the another risk of mistyping the derivative. 
mis, you know, misplacing a sign or misplacing a parentheses, that should, you know, that can happen. So it's, it's to me, having one less function to evaluate and compute is sort of worth the effort of making sure you have two very solid initial guesses. newton raphson is very fast. So if you have a big function that may be, um, or the, if you have some sort of computational limit, like if you have a processing power limitation or something, you might want to use newton raphson because in general, once again, in general, but not always, newton raphson will be faster than bisection. So are there any questions about sort of um, what the pros and cons are about each method or when you should use one or the other? And I, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about when you should use one over the other. This is something you have to feel out yourself. Um, so on, on the homework, I, I don't think it's specified which, like if you have to use a, a specific root finding method or, or another, but even if it says, to do to solve this problem, you know, using bisection, you should go back and do it again with Newton Raphson, just so you can get, you know, a sense of which one you like more um, and stuff like that. Because once again, we're showing you different methods because everyone has a different way of um, coding things. Um, I have a question. It's a yeah. general question. Sure. Um, so you said that like one of the most important things to do um, or what, what you like to do is, is looking at the plot before um, choosing a method or before trying to find the roots. But um, is there like, I feel like that kind of defeats the point of having MATLAB do that for you because a lot of the like graphing software is out there. You can just, I, I guess, zoom in and find the find the, um, the roots yourself. Even like the graphing calculator does that. So like is there like a MATLAB function, like a built-in MATLAB function that analyzes uh, plots and then actually, I'd like, is there a way that you can write a code to make MATLAB do the initial guess for you and then continue on with the code? Um, not that I know of. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. So no, I, I agree. You know, if you're plotting the function, you can see where the zeros are. So like, why even bother using bisection Newton Raphson in the first place, right? And no, that's, that's a very good point. And my answer to that is, well, we can see just from here that the root occurs around like a little over six, but if we need, you know, the precise answer, uh, let me just comment this stuff out. I may not know, for instance, that the root occurs at 6.2832, or if, um, let's see, if we run that again with more decimals, let's say we needed uh, we were working with you know, a very high precision medical grade tool or something, and we needed accuracy up to like the 10th decimal place. Obviously, graphing by, you know, by simple inspection won't give us the accuracy we need. So then, we, you, we, th then that's when we rely on the mathematical root finding tools to give us more accuracy in our answer once we exceed the capabilities of just visual inspection. Um, as for the MATLAB function that can sort of do this automatically? No, not that I know of. Um, there's a really handy MATLAB function called F0, which is one of my favorites. Um, it's basically, it, it combines, you know, things, it combines a couple of root finding methods that, you know, to give you an answer pretty fast, but it's sort of the same thing where you still have to supply your own initial guess to the function. Like it, there's no way it can do that for you. And sort of the reason for that is because the function may be very odd or very oscillatory. So it's sort of up to us as the human here to imbue meaning into these plots and sort of pick and quite literally pick and choose our points accordingly. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, we use plotting first to give us a very coarse estimate of where the root lies. And then from there, we can ascertain our initial guesses. Okay, so there are no further questions. Let's move on to uh, the root finding and curve fitting exercises. So this, this packet has three problems. I guess we're only gonna get through one or maybe two of them today, that's fine. Um, I guess it's good to review the curve fitting one first since we, uh, let's see, that was, we sort of started that a long time ago before the midterm, but here's uh, the data set, uh, let's see. 
I think this data set is contained in the uh, whatever this thing, yeah. So this, this data set here. Uh, but the first thing to note is that we have what appears to be a very nonlinear equation. And so when we're doing linear regression with a nonlinear equation, we need to linearize it. So let's see. Um, I'm just going to move this to, oh, that's not it. Okay, I'm going to move this to the other side here, just so I can uh, see if I can, I uh, will have to remember the equation, linearization. Okay, so how do we linearize this? Um, the first thing we notice is that, maybe I should just keep it up here. Okay, so the first thing we notice is that we have y equals something square root. And maybe the first thing we should do is just remove the, the square, or not, yeah, not, not square root, but remove the square um, from both sides of the equation. So we can start by doing, this is gonna be square root y equals, uh, do not remember this, a plus square root x over, okay. So a plus square root x divided by b times square root x. I think that's right. Okay. Okay. So what we notice here is that now this right hand side, we can separate this um, into two fractions, right? Because there's a common denominator here. So we have square root y equals a divided by the quantity of b times square root x plus square root x divided by that denominator. And this actually simplifies to, uh, well, I guess a over b times square root x, and then we have a square root x on top, square root x down here. So this will just be one over b. Okay, so there's another, the one last change we can make here is that we can see, okay, one over b is gonna be our slope. And then we, the last, very minor simplification we can do is just pull this out or pull, I guess, the uh, the a over b out and separate this into two terms. So that would be a over b times one over square root x. All right? if you do the multiplication, um, then you're, you're gonna get basically this term plus one over b. So that's our linearization. We have, so basically what we're saying here is that if we plot, um, one over square root x, um, and then we, we plot it with respect to the square root of y, we should get a straight line with a slope of a over b and, a, and an intercept of one over b. So that's how we can convert this very nonlinear equation into a linear form. So that's the transformation. Now we need to determine what these parameters a and b are. Okay, so um, let's see, find A and B. So we, we could type out this entire data set. I don't feel like it. That's why I gave you uh, the mat file over here. So we can load, uh, what's it called? In 2004, okay, we can just copy and paste that. Um, one thing to note, after you download it, it's gonna be in probably your downloads folder. So move it to um, your folder, um, that you, that this script is located in. Make sure it's in the same folder. It's very important. Otherwise, you can get the error. You know, MATLAB can't find this file. And so when we load it, we should get the same data set that we see in, um, yeah, in the problem here. So it's nice and easy, already done for us. Okay. So once again, as I said in the very beginning, first thing we should do when we have a data set is plot it. So let's plot the original data, just so we can sort of see what it looks like. All right, so I'm gonna open up um, a figure with a subplot. And the reason why I'm doing a subplot, I'm just sort of visualizing this in advance. I want the upper subplot, so there are gonna be two subplots on this figure. The upper one, maybe I can just plot this now. We're gonna plot the original data here. And then on the lower subplot, which we create in a bit, we're going to plot the transform data, the linearized data. So I just want to see both, you know, pretty much side by side uh, for comparison's sake. Okay, so now we can plot 
um, x and y. Let's see. Maybe we should add a grid. OK, so we can see right off the bat that the data is indeed very nonlinear, which once again justifies our need to transform this data so we can fit it linearly. And I, I guess it conforms to this equation. I don't know what this equation looks like just intuitively, but I'm guessing it sort of looks like this, almost like a decaying exponential. OK, uh, let's see. Should probably add x and y labels. And probably the most important part is the distinction that this is the original data. OK, um, let's see. Maybe I might try to bump up the line width since the default line width is pretty thin. OK, that should be fine. Um, so now, now that we have this, we can um, compute and plot these a and b coefficients. So let's see. We need to create a transform variable. So once again, we are plotting one over square root x with respect to square root of y, and that will give us the linear fit. So one divided by square root x. So I'm just going to call this xt. Uh, the t stands for transform. So to transform um, the original data to the linearized version, we just, you know, one over square root everything. Once again, we have the dot operator here because x is a data set, x is a vector. So in order to apply element-wise operations, we need that dot. And hopefully this will give us no errors. OK, so yep, this is the same size as our original data set. And if you do the math um, by hand, hopefully that is correct. And then for yt, we can do the same thing. Uh, OK, this one's easy. We just need to square root um, the original y data. OK. Now let's see what the transform data looks like. And hopefully, the expectation is when we plot it, um, we, they should be linear. And that's when we know we can apply the fit. So if we plot um, xt and yt, um, let's, OK, let's, let's plot them as squares and maybe copy that. OK, except instead of, um, so we need to make the distinction linearized data. OK, so this is, this is what we get when we plot the xt versus the yt, so the transform variables. And we can sort of see intuitively that, yes, it appears that the data is a straight line. So once we fit, um, a, cur or once we fit a line to this data, then the slope of this will be a over b, and the y-intercept will be 1 over b. And we can actually sort of maybe guess what the y-intercept is right off the bat. So um, maybe if we try to extrapolate this down, uh, maybe, yeah, well, uh, maybe we can sort of verify our answers that way later on. OK, so now that we know we have that done, now we can actually get on to the, let's see, to the curve fit. So the, the function we learned in class was the fit LM function, which admittedly, I was slightly unfamiliar with up until this semester. So I just have the documentation pulled up because I don't remember how to use it. Uh, we have one output. And then, OK, this probably is the, the one we're looking for. So we just plug in x and y to the fit LM function. OK, I guess a little distinction here. Um, remember, we are not, we are not fitting a, a, a line to x and y, we're fitting a line to the transform data. So I should make this xt, and this needs to be, oops, yt. Let's just see what happens when, when we run this. OK, so it looks like we are getting some outputs, uh, which is good. OK, 
and fit LM there. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is, I guess we can copy and paste, um, you know, these coefficients, but the more fancy way to do that is if you read the documentation, you'll see that this is, uh, you get these in terms in tabular form. And if you know how to work with tables then you'll know how to index them. So I'm just gonna say, I just wanna extract basically this number and this number. So the way we do that is model.coefficients. If we look, if we open this model um, class, there's a thing called coefficients, which is a two by four table. And so basically we wanna pull out these two numbers right here. Uh, this model um, object has a lot of like pretty useful information, most of which we won't use that's sort of out of the scope of this class. But if you ever take a more advanced curve fitting class and you, you might end up using some of these things like the MSE or the SSR and stuff like that. So basically we just wanna pull these out. Um, let's see, this is gonna be, yeah. So all the rows in the first column. Okay, there we go. So COFS is a two by one table with those numbers as expected. Um, now, if we wanna pull out each individual one, I'm gonna create a variable called intercept and that's just gonna be um, the first, oops, the first entry in this table. So that's just gonna be COFS of, not for, I think for a table, I don't think it works if you use the regular parentheses. I think you have to use the curly braces. I think off the top of my head. Yeah, okay, there we go. So that's just the value of the intercept. And then we can do the same thing for the slope. Um, it's set now instead of cof one one, it's just gonna be this number right here. Okay, so I guess we can um, uncomment this. Okay, so this is the slope and uh, y-intercept of our linearized data. But that's not the answer because we need to determine what a and b are. Now, if we remember, the intercept equals one over b. So we can just say b equals one over the intercept. We should get something like 2.44. And then a, okay, so let's see. So the slope of the line is just A over B. So that means we solve for, we just move B over. Okay, so that's gonna be B times, oops, B times the slope. And I guess I can uncomment these out now. Okay, so that's our value of A and B for this problem. Uh, the last thing we can do is pull out the r squared. Yes, I know that when you um, run this fit LM function, it'll give you the r squared here, but normally the r squared isn't exactly one. Um, that, that very rarely happens. It's usually around like 0.9997 or something. The reason why it displays is one is just because of, you know, so MATLAB can fit everything on the screen here. So this is actually rounded. If we want to obtain the actual value, we can go into here. We can see that there's a, um, a, a thing called R squared. And we can see that, um, okay, so there are two things. We don't need to worry about the adjusted R squared, just the ordinary R squared is instead of one, it's 0.999. And you might be thinking, okay, well, you know, what's the difference between 0.999 and one? But I think just to be mathematically correct, we should extract that. So we can pull that field out by doing mdl.r squared dot ordinary. I think that's it. Yeah, so there's, we index this. We need to go into the r squared. So basically what we're doing here is that the, when we're using the, the, the period here in this, in this form, it basically tells us we're going into the model. We're going into the field called r squared. And then within this r squared field, there are two things. And so we just pull out the, the variable contained in the ordinary field. So it's, it's kind of like File Explorer where um, you have a whole bunch of, I guess, different subfolders within a main folder, kind of the same thing here. 
OK, so now we can see that the R squared is, um, it's actually not even 0.9999. It's actually 0.9998. And so this extra accuracy might be useful to us. OK, so now that we have um, our, our curve fit coefficients, uh, let's see if we can decently fit the original data using this. So I'm just going to call this my fit equals at x. And what we can do is we can try to plug in this equation now that we know our values of a and b. OK, hopefully I remember all of this. So a plus square root of x. Um, let's see, so that's going to be b times square root x. I think all this is squared. I need to close that. Add another parentheses dot squared. OK, so no syntax errors there. Then we can go back to the first subplot. And then we can throw up an F plot here. OK, so we plotted from 0.5 to 4. Uh, let's see. Actually, a more elegant way would just be to plot this from the, the min to the max of our data set. All right, fingers crossed. Oh, nice, there we go. Okay, so here we can see that when we, we made an anonymous function, now that we know what A and B supposedly are, and we can see that our, our function passes through the original data points. So that should tell us that we have the correct A and B, which is, which is what we want. Okay, so that's, that's a really good check. Now what we need to do is check the linearity assumptions. Um, there was a PowerPoint here. Um, you can copy and paste all of this. I, I'm just going to say it's fine. Yes, for the sake of completion, we should be doing all this, but I'm just going to skip it for now. This is really bad practice. Please don't do this on your homework or on your workshop or whatever, um, but I'm just being lazy right now. So um, now that we have that, we want to predict why at these two values of x. OK, so let's create a vector with whatever these two values are, 1.6 and 3.5. OK, so I created a row vector. I transposed it to make it a column vector. The reason why I need to do that is like for, for some weird reason, um, fit LM only accepts column vectors and not row vectors. I, I don't know why. So that's just a weird subtlety we need to do. Now, once again, we need to, um, let's see, plug these two prediction points into our curve fit. So we need to transform these uh, these predicted points in order to plug it into our curve fit model. So what was it? One over square root of x predict, and that'll give us our linearized version. OK, no syntax errors there. I guess I'm just going to um, oops, uncomment these, or, comment, or suppress them for now. OK, so now. We, need, we can do, we can call the predict function. So we plug these transformed points um, into our model. However, this is not the answer because once again, these are the transform points. We need to untransform them back into their, their nonlinear forms and that'll actually give us the correct Y values. So in order to do that, um, let's see. What was it? Okay, so these should all be the square rooted values. So to get y, we just need to square. Um, yeah, we just so, so that's that's all I think we need to do, and that should give us these answers here. Um, let's see. Can't you just plug in the x into the myfit function? Yes, you can, and that's what we're going to do next. So, oops my fit and let's say x predict i don't know if this is going to give us an error or not okay because okay so what we can see here is that 
um, I'm just going to call this call this my fit check. And so yes, you're exactly right. We did it this way using the predict function, which which required us to transform the data and stuff like that. But then we have a second check with this anonymous function. And so this anonymous function is the nonlinear version. So we know so to to plug in, we need to um, plug in the the regular points. We don't need to, to plug in the transform points because we're, we're plugging this directly into the highly nonlinear equation. And you can see that for y predict and this secondary check, we get the exact same answers, which is good. And then the last thing we can do is we can, uh, we can append this to the plots. So, okay, uh, why don't we plot Let's see. Let's see if we can plot the predicted points on here. And what should happen is that hopefully the predicted points will lie exactly on this uh, red line. So we can plot x predict and y predict. Let's plot that. OK, so that, this is exactly as expected. So here we have the two predicted points, and um, they lie exactly on the line. So we know that we had the correct y value here. And then let's see. If we go down here, what we should do is try to see if we can get the same results. So hopefully these two triangular points will lie somewhere along this line down here. So if we switch to the second subplot now we can plot the the transformed predicted points and i need to change this to y predict i think that's right okay so here we go so here are the two transform points and they appear to lie on this line there so that tells us that our predictions line up perfectly with both the linearized, uh, the linearized down here and the non-linearized data. So that's good. Um, the one sort of last thing we can do is uh, we can actually plot the, the model itself. So uh, I just want to make sure I'm on. OK, so we can actually plot the model. Now, this is an interesting use of the plot function. Normally, when we're plotting stuff, we have to supply you know, something on the x-axis and something on the y-axis. And then we have a bunch of full optional arguments for, uh, to, to prettify the plot. But for this very specific usage of plot, all we have to do is plug in the model, which is the output of our fit LM function. So MATLAB is smart enough to know that when you supply one argument um, of this very particular linear model, object in MATLAB, if we run it, it will produce a very nice looking plot of um, you know, the data, which is in X's, which you can't see because they're obscured by our original plotting, which is good because they should overlap. Um, and then this, this red solid line, which is our curve fit. And once again, uh, this red line passes through all of our data points. So this is validating our, our answers. Um, if you scroll in a lot, you'll see these like dotted red lines, which is a confidence bound. Um, that's not really important to uh, what we're doing in this class, but if you take a more advanced stat class, which I think you have to, I don't remember, um, you'll learn more about the confidence bounds. And then um, I, I just want to quickly, this is sort of a, a, a digression, but I'd like to mention sort of for the sake of, I think, completion, when you have this output from the fit LM function, obviously the most important things are what the coefficients are. But when you're plotting multiple things on, I guess like when you're trying to fit a model which involves multiple ind independent variables, what you should also look at is this thing called the p-value. And this p-value tells you if there's a statistical significance or if there's, yeah, if like the correlation between um, one of these like X variables and your dependent variable is statistically significant. If you've taken a stat class, you may be familiar with the term alpha equals 0.05 or like your default significance level. And what that basically tells us is that you, need to, you can compare your p-value 
to the value alpha equals 0.05. We see that both of these values are very small. So um, they're, they're both very much less than 0.05, which tells us that yes, the intercept and X1 for this model, there's a very strong um, correlation between um, the, the independent variable and the dependent variable. I guess a better way of wording that is, um, there's some, I, I don't remember the, the precise wording, but it's something along the lines of, um, if your p-value is less than 0.05, then you have enough evidence to conclude that there is a non-zero statistical link um, between whatever x, whatever independent variable and the y variable. So if, th if this p-value for x1, let's say, was something ridiculously big, like six, which is well above 0.05, then what that basically means is you can discard, you can effectively discard this X1 variable from your model because there's no statistical significance linking it to the dependent variable. So when you, um, I think, and obviously this is like very little to do with this problem because obviously since there's only one variable, there's going to be a very high statistical um, significance. But if you have, if you ever have to, to maybe plot like three things, um, which I think you might have to do in your homework, um, I would look at sort of the p-value for maybe not if you have just like x1, but if you have like x1, x2, x3, and x4, and see if there are any p-values that are well above the value of 0.05, because that might lead to some very interesting conclusions about the fidelity of your model. And so um, we didn't get to, uh, let's see, this question, oops, that's not it, this question right here, but fortunately, or unfortunately for all of you, um, I'll be back on Monday, so we can actually pick off, um, pick up where we left off with. Maybe I'll sort of bypass a third problem, but I definitely want to, you know, point some things out about the parachute problem uh, for this one because there are a few sort of subtle points embedded in this in this problem. So once again, um, we're basically right on time. Thank you for showing up. I really hope I recorded this. Um, okay, yeah, I just had to like quadruple check. Um, yeah, because there was a very last minute change. Uh, I'll, I'll be posting this on Canvas or something, wherever it gets posted. And if it doesn't get posted to Canvas, I'll figure out a way to put it on my YouTube channel or something. Um, but anyways, thanks for coming. Hope you guys have a nice weekend. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a few minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll add the file. I'll, I'll, put, I'll clean this up a little bit, and then I'll post it on Canvas. Um, I had a quick question. So. Um... I tried to follow you, and, and for some reason, my the code that I typed isn't um, running correctly. Okay, uh, let me. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing.